It's like when they were playing our song, they just looked so much cooler than us <laughs> and performed it so much better. I was like, this video is real. This is real life. <laughs> What is up, my friends? Thanks so much for tuning in again. This is the Scoped Exposure Podcast. Um, you know, it, it's been fun to to look back at some, you know, maybe not necessarily like top episodes as far as number wise, but like episodes that just like left me wanting more, um, you know, certain guests that like I just had such a great conversation with either in the first or second season that I definitely wanted to bring back. And with a fresh Koyo record just on the horizon for us, um, I knew that I wanted to hit up Joey again to talk about the band and, you know, even just in prepping for this episode, I've been like very excited on some of the things that um, are going to be con continuations of Joey, Joey and I's first initial discussion as well as stuff that we didn't get to hit on the first time just because, you know, there's there's a lot of, um, you know, ground that we needed to cover. So I feel like this is going to be a great part two episode. And uh, without further ado, I'm very excited to be welcoming Joey of Koyo on the Scope Social Podcast once again. Thanks for joining me, bud. Dude, thank you for having me back. I'm I'm truly, truly psyched on it. The, this one was always, uh, especially early on, like what, one of the uh, the podcasts I was truly psyched on doing. It was a great conversation. Just psyched to run it back, dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like we were talking just before we get going here about, I guess, uh, someone, uh, a friend of yours had listened to our conversation. I was like, yeah, I think some dude in Canada was talking to you. Uh, yeah, which yeah. Is maybe the the one big dis uh, differentiator compared to all the other hardcore podcasts in the game right now. Um, For but, sure. But the other thing, too, is that, like, you know, I was a fan of, you know, watching interviews uh, of bands that I liked growing up. And I always hated when an interview was interview were was like super nervous and there's definitely times i'm nervous talking to people but like you know i definitely wanted to be able to create a space for like good conversations good discussions and you know you were high on my list for you know people to revisit for season three and uh i feel like there's a lot of good shit that i'm excited for us to talk about here today for sure and and again like truly appreciate you being down to have me back because you know a lot, a lot of people out there to talk to. I've, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, a lot of bands, a lot of people doing it. So it's, it's just cool to that you just carved out a little time for me again. Of course, and I feel like there's a lot to talk about just on just how much things have changed for Koyo since our first discussions. I think I was looking back, and I think the episode dropped in January of 2022, and I think we recorded that maybe into December because I remember it was yeah. Like, kind of mentioning like end of the year things and then march of 2022 that's when y'all announced the pure noise acquisition and it feels like it's been a world of a difference since there but before totally. we get into any of the music chats joey as you know we got to check some bevs before we get on mm -hmm. to uh into the music discussion so what are you bringing for the show today so it, it's it's nothing too crazy um it is just a really huge uh massive jug of water my girlfriend complains that I don't drink enough water. I don't think that's necessarily <laughs> true, but I am appeasing by taking her giant Stanley cup of uh of of water and and slamming it. So mm -hmm. it's water for me today. Yeah. No, which is like, you know, it's always funny when people come on and they're like, Oh, it's nothing too fancy if it's like, you know, everyone's on their own bev journey, right? And so, you know, I, I highly applaud people who are trying to intake more water and, and stay more hydrated, whether that's drinking as many cans as possible versus, you know, doing the economically smart thing of just filling mm. up the the jug, you know? It, it, it is a all around positive thing. You know, <laughs> I, I, I can't complain. And hey, water's dope. I'm not even like a water hater. There are water hater people in the world and it's it leaves me very confused. Water's awesome. I would argue but. those people probably hate themselves because we as human beings are largely made up of water as well. So Yeah. I've I've met many people who are just like, yo, I don't like water. I just don't like the taste. I don't like how it feels. Whatever, whatever. It's like it <laughs> hydrates you. It literally makes you feel good. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny because I I remember on the um, 
when our first episode, I think you were drinking like just like Starbucks, like dark roast coffee, like straight out of like the the oh, pitcher, yeah. you know, unapologetically about it. So you know, we've fully swing to the other side of uh yeah of the, the, this, this is the the complete other side of the spectrum mm -hmm. it's pretty crazy uh, so i'm also drinking water but something a little bit more fancy um so um i'm uh you know joey i don't know if you how how close you follow some of the scoped uh, happenings, but uh, I've been spending some time uh, this year just out in eastern Canada where my uh, parents are based. And one of my favorite seltzer companies that I've discovered that's only kind of based in here, um, in here being Ontario more so, um, but isn't mm. available in western Canada is a brand called City Seltzer. And uh, I guess they did, and I felt like, you know, the the sooner. Uh, if I if I don't consume this soon enough, it will feel like very out of place. Um, but I guess they did like a bit of a a, a flavor just for for Pride Month. So it's oh, nice. the Pride City flavor, and it's orange lime and raspberry. But this brand like has no misses. Like everything I've yeah. had from them has been fantastic. Um, my favorite flavor is this one where it's huckleberry. And I've never had a huckleberry anything in my life. And it's like, like, bury me with any specific beverage. It's that one specific. Yeah, that sounds awesome, dude. Yeah, that sounds so, really good. Joey, cheers to you, you know, mm -hmm. a little closer cheers. than we first were, you know, but uh, yeah, very excited to have you back on the pod. Dude, psyched on it. Oh, yeah. That's hydrating. That is hydrating. It's doing what it does. This, I, I love is, seltzer. So I, I'm, I'm jealous of what you got right there. <laughs> I know, um, you know, being more in the northeast side of things, I know a lot of people who come on the pod swear by polar. Um, yeah, are you kind I'm, of in the same camp of that? I'm definitely I'm I'm polar ride or die in the sense that it's it's my favorite, but I am not a, a seltzer snob either. Like I'm okay. down for whatever. I will drink the store brand lemon seltzer you know for 99 cents a, a can like that's cool <laughs> by me I, I don't need anything fancy mm. but polar is my preferred brand if i'm yeah. if i'm picking yeah so polar would be on the koyo rider for like a headliner kind of thing yeah for sure i i, I would i would throw a, a 12 pack of like black cherry in there and Dude, be psyched black every cherry, night black cherry is like goaded the best flavor across the board for any seltzer company it it's... is undeniable mm -hmm. and then polar also uh they have these they, they do like so many like seasonal offerings and they have these little uh i think they're literally called like little mermaids they're these little like shot size cans of these like seasonal flavors or mermaid oh, okay. kisses or some shit like that but it was crazy it it, it tastes unbelievable just very like fruity sweet but without it obviously literally being sweet like just tasted so great and, and i think they're still available i was getting them a yeah. lot for a minute. oh they're like little seltzer juniors it seems like mm -hmm. yeah yeah, they're, yeah. They're, oh they're, i have seen these yeah that looks crazy it's some of the best flavors i've ever had in my opinion mm -hmm. like really good interesting okay well i got some bev research to do after this episode um, yeah take a crack at it if, if you got one in your <laughs> in your local shop it's it's dope right so so joey uh you know for fans that might have missed your first episode you know obviously we covered a lot of your um your own individual like you know origin story when it comes to hardcore which covered a lot of like the early beginnings of koyo and um and how you know things have shifted but like I said in the, the beginning of the episode, it feels like a world of a difference since we last spoke. So, you know, normally for like part two or even part three episodes, I kind of like, you know, we do the Bev check and then I kind of do a vibe check to see how you're doing, like, uh, you know, what's up in your world right now and how you're feeling with like how things are going with uh, the band and obviously the new record coming up. For sure. I mean, I, I myself am, am doing pretty good. If I'm being honest, for a minute, I wasn't. There was like a, a good second uh, where last last year, now this year being 2023, like 2022, I, I, I kind of had a a little, a little, you know, rough patch uh, where, where I wasn't feeling too great about anything. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, all in all, I feel really great and feel psyched on where the band's at and psyched on where my life's at literally speaking in this moment i've been uh 
I've been in LA for about two weeks now. I'm going to be here another two weeks. Uh, my girlfriend's from out here. So we bounce back and forth, you know, I'll, I'll crash for a month. She comes to New York crash for a month. And, uh, she toured with us for a while as well because she did touring photo before we met. So naturally when we started dating, it was just kind of like, Oh, well, you are a tenured touring photographer. Why don't you just come on tour? Mm -hmm. So, so we, you know, we, we, we did a lot of like the 22, 2023, uh, touring together and whatnot, but I'm, I'm just been chilling here, just kind of reset and decompressing after all of our summer touring that we did. And, getting ready to drop the record which is really exciting because it's our debut lp and uh do some some stuff in the fall following that you know we don't have any extensive extensive touring lined up like we kind of did all of our full us full month out for a minute touring for the year um so the fall is going to be a lot more quick hit type stuff you know we right. there we here fly out there type thing yeah, I saw that you guys are uh, doing some shows with Super Heaven, and you're coming up to Toronto, which is the closest where I'm at. So I'm definitely going to be coming to that show. Um, not yeah. only to I'm see really you, but like those. Super Heaven is like goaded uh, band. Dude, they're so. amazing. Like, I, like when we got the uh, the offer, Higher Power had to drop those shows. Um, I don't mm. know the exact reasoning, but it's unfortunate because I love them. And in a perfect world, we would both just do it. Yeah, but, but uh, <laughs> when when the offer came in to fill in for those slots originally october was supposed to just be like a hard off month for us like mm -hmm. we've kind of not that we always have control over these things because especially with support stuff offers come in and you sometimes you just got to take it um but for that particular uh offer like it was a no-brainer we like yeah of course we'll fucking do this it's like i don't need october off like if it's four days of super heaven like I, right. if, they, if they hit us up we're like yo could you do a month we probably would have said yeah you know like mm -hmm. we, we we found that like taking calculated amounts of time off like in between the touring is like healthy for everyone and right. you know staying busy and keeping the whole full-time full touring effort uh going but sometimes you just gotta say fuck it you know and that would be a, a total fuck it like i love super <laughs> heaven they're yeah, awesome absolutely and and you know like uh you can share as little or as much as you want i'm just kind of curious on like you know some the bit of a, a rough time that you were mentioning of you know i don't know if it was the entire year of 2022 or kind of more on uh, a specific season I'm just kind of curious more so if that was in the midst of writing this new record, if there were anything even tied to music or if it was totally outside of, yeah. again, you share as much or as little as you want. It it, it was amidst uh, doing the record too. Um, es essentially, you know, just to summarize, I was just really, really uh, burnt out on – and granted, I know we haven't been doing this that, that long, and obviously I very much appreciate uh, what we do and the fact that I get to do it uh, at the, in the capacity we do. Um, but essentially, like, once COVID let up, we just were off to the races. So all of fall 2021 into 2022, we, we were touring nonstop. We played, mm -hmm. like, from fall 2021 to the middle of 2022 when we started recording Would You Miss It, I think I had one month off. So we were just going crazy. endlessly. Like, mm -hmm. if we were not touring, we were writing to ultimately and demoing and pre-proing uh, what would be the record. And then we recorded the record for a month and then we flew out and did Sound and Fury. And then when we came back from that, we did a whole nother fall of full US, Europe, a week with Drain. Um, we just, it was nonstop. You know, we, we, we played 200 something shows in less than a year, um, which was awesome. I'm glad we did that. I would do it again, but you know, we were a band that was cutting our teeth on, on that, you know, getting our establishing ourselves, you know, when you're doing that type of touring, you're doing it for very little money. If any, you know, we're, we're doing it day one mode, you know, it doesn't matter that we've played in other bands or whatever. We're, we're opening tours and sleeping on floors and going through interpersonal life stuff while we're at it because we're all a little older, you know, we're doing this band right. in our mid twenties. So there's, life pains and growing pains and stuff that just kind of was rubbing against the band while we're doing all this, like going fucking crazy psycho mode. So uh, I just kind of hit a wall with it where I just felt really burnt. I felt like I just, no matter how hard I tried, I, I was not 
fully available uh, to the band. And I think that just made the issue and, and beyond the band, just my life. Like I was like totally tapped out for a second um, and just felt like I wasn't uh, a positive force in any part of anyone's life for a second. Mm-hmm. You know, I just sure. uh, I was a little burnt and I was very um, I, I kept trying to be available. I kept trying to be like the playmaker and be the guy holding it down because, you know, I tour managed for so long. I still tour manage for Koyo to this day um, at this moment. Um, Just because why would I not when I know how to do it? Um, And uh, I I kept tapping in and like making myself available um, amidst all these mounting problems and mounting bad feelings. And then eventually I think I just hit a wall. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I bounce back. I'm all good. It's all good. You know, I, f- I feel a lot, a lot better about things, um, that I did, but a lot of that definitely got channeled into the record naturally. Um, you know, the last track on the record is more or less just almost entirely about that, um, about that time, about that feeling, but you know, it's, it's, it was a, a time block that that's no one's fault like no one did anything wrong i don't i'm not mad at anybody you know i have the the illest friends in the world and the illest band and i'm i'm very very lucky to be surrounded by the people that i am you know totally. i just uh we we just like i said we went off to the races and doing your own band like that uh, is a different experience than if you are working for a band, which obviously I toured a lot with Typecast doing the same stuff, but Typecast's touring and Eternal Gauntlet of touring was kind of funded by working for Vane, so I, the financial component didn't stress me out as much. And mm-hmm. also it was just, I was younger and just had less pressure internally to, uh, yeah. you know, figure life stuff out in a variety of ways and you know there's just also things that happen that i would individually like to not 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 even just for myself just amidst everyone's uh in the band's lives like hard times and stuff that just came up while we were touring stuff that's not my place to discuss but it's like it all weighs and weighs on you know like when you're out there doing it real time like for living it uh to the extent that we have been it's like it's it's hard to um it, it's hard to be available to problems in your life and people who might be need, needing help in your life or needing you as a support system or this or that when uh you're literally three thousand miles away you know right, and, and right. living in a van or on a different time or in Europe so it's just uh you know just uh an all around really dope beautiful time like the bull run that was Mm -hmm. essentially from when we dropped off on our last episode to now (laughs) and uh something i would totally do again but just have learned a whole lot in the process in terms of being a band and taking care of yourself and taking care of your head when you're doing it like this yeah And, and and i think like yeah like i think any whether it's uh, doing something within your work or doing something in music or even like, um, you know, when you're in the gym, like you sometimes have to push yourself beyond what you think your limits are to actually know, like, you know, like kind of stretch yourself a little bit and see like what you're actually made of. And sometimes yeah. that's like a, a, a slippery slope where, you know, it, I, I think even in a 2023, you know, hardcore world, like, there is still the necessary like going hard on touring if that's what you're really trying to do especially you know being behind the label like pure noise like you know that's not going to be something that they're just kind of like oh yeah we'll just get a band that's you know not gonna kind of do um you know a little bit here and there like it makes sense for a band to be on a label and like you know go and promote themselves and do all that like that will never go away um you know with the the changing of of tides with the scene um but there is like a balancing act there where you either have gone too far or you're like oh i anticipate this coming up so if anything it sounds like you've kind of learned where the limits are and and how much time you need to kind of like like you said reset or kind of get back um but also kind of knowing like this is the stuff that i want to 
you know, be in control of or have my stake in. And, you know, maybe some of this other stuff that was, you know, giving me grief or stressing me out, maybe that can either be handed off to someone else or like, I don't have to have my hands on it as, as much. For sure. For sure. And, and, and that in itself is actually an interesting point too, where I realize I have a, a very hard time, like taking my hands off the wheel with shit when it's something mm -hmm. I, I care a lot about and, and Koyo is something I care about more than most things in my life uh you know this band could end tomorrow and it will still be like yo that was that was my baby right there you know that was mm -hmm. like one of the like that was some inconceivable shit that me and my friends got to do and build and create and and run it's like that will be one of my proudest things i've ever done regardless of uh how long it lasts but for that reason it's really hard to just go yeah all good and I, I think I've gotten a lot better at that in recent times, or I try to. Um, but there was a, a there was a time like amidst that time period I'm talking about, I feel like I couldn't even discuss anything um, about the band w without it stressing me out because it felt like everything was in some way like every minutia, even the smallest thing, it all felt like some like responsibility that that. Mm. It's not necessarily, you know, like picking a, you know, weighing in on a merch spread for tour, you know, like figuring out, you know, advancing another tour, you know, like where we're getting a hotel one night, who we crashing with, you know, like these things, like just regular questions and thoughts and stuff you encounter in a space doing a band. They're totally normal and shouldn't be stressful and shouldn't be, shouldn't put some like indebted weight to uh discuss like on me or anyone to discuss but that's how i felt at the time it was like everything just had this like weight to it for no reason like it didn't matter what it was i just could not talk about the band without like it's like one thought would trigger into a million more stressful thoughts yeah i, mm -hmm. I just was not in the right head space at all yeah um, and, and naturally and again, when that, you're... that is very much past you know i right, i, I say sure. all that, that retrospectively at this point now being able to look back at that mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think it's very, you know, it's, it, you know, when you're super passionate about something or like you said, like something's your baby. Like when I talk about different scope things, like my mind will just like Jordan who produces the show can attest that like, sometimes I'll just call him with one idea and then I'll just ramble on like a million different things. And then I look at like the amount of time we've been on the call and it's like, Oh, like we've been on, on for like 20 minutes and I almost like have not let you spoken at all so mm -hmm. you know i can I, relate i feel Jordan's that. also like you know a, a silent uh um sorcerer i'll say you know he mm -hmm. he uh is a man of few words but he's like in my opinion very uh intelligent on on how we do this whole sh you know how we do the different things that we do um but like you know i for a long time even when you were first on the show i was like you know, I was really going hard at trying to, uh, you know, still do the podcast on my own amidst everything else. And then I was like, I need to find a way to have to take my hands off the wheel a little bit. So now like bringing him in, he does all the editing, the uploading and all all that is left for me in my world is like getting the guests, doing the interview and then doing the social media stuff. But for like, sure. that stresses me way less out and at the same time it's like it is my thing so if there's something that happens and um something wrong with the upload or or whatever it's like it's still like you know the the trail ends up falling to me and it's my responsibility to, to sort it out uh versus like yeah. pointing the finger and you know anything like that but um totally sounds, totally get that yeah so yeah I, i'm glad that you you know had a time because I'm a firm believer that, you know, we learn more from like the the negative things that happen to us more so than the positives because the positives just kind of confirm like, yeah, well, I know how to to do this or, or run that. But usually it's like the more negative things we're like, oh, and then now I, I see, you know, where I was maybe had a bit of a blind spot to or, or anything like that. So for sure. And, and also like amidst all that, I think the band also just had some bad luck here and there, had some tough uh, growing pain stuff as we were, we were doing it, you know, like li little, little things like getting robbed in Buffalo or, you know, um, just, uh, you know, losing a shit ton of money in Europe and, you know, just ra random shit where we were just like, okay, 
Well, I mean, the robbed part is out of our control, but you know, right. like there was just a lot of things along that like bull run year of touring where we just were like, okay, well, through eating shit in this way, we now know how to do this better next time, you know, like mm-hmm. how to how do this more efficiently, you know, in, in every sense, logistically, cost, mental. It's like there's just been so much uh so much learning uh throughout that time, which right. is a very positive thing. There's some shit in life that you can only uh only learn through like trial by fire, like positives that can only come from, you know, eating shit or just having uh some adversity. And I'm I'm glad that we've I think I think we've built like a compounding amount of uh positive knowledge and uh change in functionality, like accounting for all of that adversity. For sure. Yeah, and and yeah, like I feel like even though you guys maybe haven't been a band um that's played for like, you know, 10 years, it's almost like I've seen so much growth as well as like the hardships that we're talking about like you mentioned all, all of you know getting robbed fucking sucks like i don't i don't believe any band should like i i would never wish that on any band like um as far as the time of recording this you guys like kind of had like a ding in with your um uh with your or is that with the van is that what you're yeah. referring to oh, okay. uh that, that that's a more recent scenario but it mm-hmm. it, it attests to what we call the the coyo curse uh the coyo curse that, spelled with a, a k k u r s e oh yeah the real, real thing like we we can't catch a break like we have so much good fortune and so many positive things that happened to this band you know we've been given so much opportunity there's so many people that have a, a connection to it and that obviously means a lot to all of us right um but we are the band that blows a tire four times in a tour has van problems every tour um we did that week with bayside running back the the tour that we did back in february mm-hmm. um it was supposed to be like a fun reunion week. You know, we'll go out, play a couple, like five shows just for shits and gigs, easy time, no stress. We are coming home from the last night. We're like, oh, it's Buffalo, New York. Yeah, that's far away. But if we overnight home, it'll be six hours. So let's just overnight. Um, and we stopped at a 7 Eleven, got some snacks, continued on with our drive. At this point, we've been at it for like two hours, maybe tops, probably a little less. And this lady um, rear ends us and like just tries to pass us in like a dotted lane where you're allowed to pass Mm -hmm. and just slams right into the trailer, um, sends us flying. Uh, The trailer snapped off, the arm snapped off. So the trailer itself snapped off the hitch and went flying into somebody's yard. And thankfully we didn't flip because if the trailer didn't snap, we 100% would have flipped. And we have well had because we're getting rid of them via this but we had built bunks in there and the the scary thought of what might might have happened if we flipped um is uh you know enough to tear down the the bunks that we spent a late night building with our friend mark um yeah. so you, you so the bunks are gone at this point yeah the the van is going to be all right um but the bunks are going to get sawed down before the uh the Thursday tour that we're doing uh, in September. Yeah. But, you know, and even that, but it's, it's more than just, Oh, we got into a car accident. Here's where the, the coil curse comes in. <laughs> um, we There's layers to this, you know, there, there are sandwich. in fact layers. So mm-hmm. we didn't get insurance on the U-Haul. Um, we typically don't call it, call it a spade a spade. We've just on every tour, we've said, well, I mean, like, you know, the worst thing that happens is someone slams into the U-Haul and it dents it. Because U-Hauls are, those trailers are pretty sturdy. You know, yeah. like, it, the the thought of a U-Haul getting totaled is, it, it, it's a difficult occurrence, even in your worst it, car that's, accident. That's a risk that many people listen to this podcast make almost every tour that they do. Exactly. It's mm-hmm. it's an expensive bill if you want the insurance and perhaps it's worth it, but expensive nonetheless, especially mm-hmm. when you're a broke touring Harker band. Um, so uh, we go home from this. The van's a little banged up. The trailer smashed into it. The, the side doors are totally fucked. Um, uh, the hitch is ripped. And like there's a lot of mostly structurally sound, but there's a lot of uh, – 
a lot of damage to the front and back door and the hedge. There's work that needs to be done. The van is not totaled, thankfully. What we come to find is we have the person that hit us. Uh, we have her information, um, but we the car was a rental, and we don't have the rental car's insurance. Now, the kicker in this is you'd figure, okay, like car accident, everyone exchange insurance, there's a police report, whatever, whatever. Um, uh, we have all – we have her government name. We have her address. We have, like, uh, her – we have the license plate number on the car. We do not – we didn't – there was just a what-the-fuck moment of, like, holy shit, we didn't get her insurance. And we found out that internationally uh, – because she was a Canadian driver, we uh, the DMV and like an insurance company can't run international plates. I don't know if you knew this was a thing, but we not. cannot. No, we we are not legally able to run her plates. So we had a friend in Canada, I think. I don't know the exact connection. Just someone said they asked a favor to try and. Uh, you know, confirm this person's insurance or information, whatever the fuck it was. I have no idea uh, what they did or whatever, but uh, what we were able to confirm is that it was a rental and she's not attached to the insurance on the car. So it's just, we, we, we're dead end. We're at a total <laughs> dead end. So what's going to probably happen is we're going to get paying thousands of dollars for the U-Haul because it's probably totaled. And we just, it's very unlikely she will give us insurance uh we're gonna reach out one more time asking but odds are she's just totally ghosted so us. she so, is so. just some southern ontario probably lives in windsor and they were just like down for a little overnight trek driving irresponsibly and just ruined it for these long island boys yeah straight up and just gets away with it and, and we looked her up on linkedin Fuck, she's dude. like a ceo of some company like she has money but and, what? And it's, we don't even like want her her money. Like we don't even want to like sue her for tons of money. I don't think we even have the the grounds beyond like the damages of the van or whatever. It's just like she didn't give us her fucking insurance, and and for that reason we're we're stuck holding the bag on on the van. You know, like it's just uh that's that's what I mean by the coil curse of the way of when things go wrong, Bro. they just go so fucking wrong. It's insane. See, I don't post really like, well, there's no scoped LinkedIn anything, but part of me wants to be petty and post this clip from the podcast. And then you can tell me who the CEO person is and just tag their company and be like, are you going to stand by so-and-so's actions? Yeah, uh, yeah, straight up. <laughs> are, are, are you with like, Everyone in their office, you know, all suit and tie and all that, they're like, oh, what is going on that these, like, you know, punk kids are talking about Susan or whatever her, her name yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Has no yeah. connection to anything that we're doing. <laughs> yeah, dude. But we're... We're 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 gonna try one more time to get her to budge and uh yeah. you know, we we got new doors for the van from a junkyard, so we're Spanos, our bass player's uncle is gonna help replace the, the doors and whatnot. Okay. And you know, we're we're rolling. We still gotta fix the hitch and stuff, but there's uh you know, we'll we'll take care of the work, you know. We... One van part at a time, you know. Exactly. <laughs> it we'll we'll be okay for tour this fall, but it's just yeah. like you know that that's that's the type of stuff we we go through when we just did Europe. It's like we left Outbreak Fest and started a twenty seven. What ended up being a twenty seven hour straight travel day to Germany for a fest we played in Hamburg, um, and we got held up at. So I don't know if you know this but touring Europe got a little more complicated if you're an uh, American band because they implicated this new uh import document called the carne and it's it's a whole annoying thing to explain but just total layman's like explanation essentially it's a thousand dollar document that says what you have in your van and trailer um it's like an import thing it's related to brexit and when you you have to get this document stamped um oh, at a okay. like but the it's like a truck truck driving document it's for truckers um but yeah. bands because you're, I guess, towing and hauling equipment, kind of get looped into this document at like qualification wise, 
in my opinion, wrongfully so. Bands, oh, and, bands on tour shouldn't if, have to deal with this. Yeah, because you, if you're a truck driver and you're you know working there, I would assume that the company is the one paying for that document, not yeah. the truck driver themselves. Exactly. Um, and, and in our case, you know, we have to foot the bill on these, which is annoying for one. Um, but when we when we want to go from, say, the UK to Europe, we have to go to this shipping yard in Sevington, I think it is, or Servington. But it's right by Dover. Mm -hmm. And it's literally a giant yard with these makeshift offices that only truck drivers are at. It's truck drivers and occasionally bands like ours <laughs> go and get their document stamps and you could get stuck there for hours if you're pay I've, I've never went in the office there and not seen someone arguing about their paperwork ha or being laid into by a, someone at the office about how their paperwork is wrong right no one in britain totally like understands like again a broad level people don't understand the carne stuff but the carne people expect everyone to know it and no one in society has any idea how it works beyond the fact that well, people when need you it. said when you said carne, I'm like, is that just a European, like, you know, pastry? Like, that's what it yeah, sounded like. I wish, to me. I wish, <laughs> I, wish. I, I, I would, I would embrace it <laughs> full, full force. Yeah. But, uh, and, and it, it's funny that you're saying, uh, a lot of this stuff just on the, the trucking side. And, and I don't, I don't talk about this much on the podcast, but like, um, my, my father and my grandfather both work in, in the trucking industry, like both in sales. Like, my grandpa's retired now. But a lot of my early career stuff, I was working in the marketing department for a trucking company. So I would wow, that's fully crazy. understand all of the kind of the the things within the industry. And it's very common for certain uh, truck drivers uh, who will get held up at customers for long amounts of time uh, at the border, especially for, if they're working for companies that don't have their shit together. Um, mm -hmm. Luckily, like my dad works for like a pretty like pretty large size company. Like I think they have like maybe oh, it's been a while since I asked him, but at the time it was like 2,500 drivers. It's probably way that's, more than that's that. That's pretty sizable. That, for that's sure. Pretty crazy. Yeah. And they go all across Canada. They have a U.S. division. So like they have the manpower and the, and, and the scale of the operation to make sure that, you know, you know, even when hiccups do arise that they can be solved quickly versus maybe there's one person who operates on the, the border crossing side, but you know, they're, you know, on the phone like all day, you know? So it's, uh, it's always, you know, when you're saying like, Oh yeah, like certain trucking, you know, they'll be sitting there forever. And that has a bottleneck effect for all the other truck drivers as well as just these random bands who are just trying to get to another country to play a show yeah. to maybe a hundred people, you know? It's it, exactly. It, it's insanity. It's fucking mm -hmm. crazy. And then the other thing, the other kicker about this is you need a stamp from both borders. So you need your stamp from the uh, Servington Yard or Sevington and you know, you're there for hours waiting. And perhaps, you know, in our case, we had another hiccup where our van got because of another tour manager that had the van from the rental company beforehand. It got this thing called GMR status like that in itself is a whole other thing. But essentially, like to anyone listening, our van got flagged as like a freight vehicle that it's not. And for that reason, our van could have potentially been audited and not every single pe like a carne wants even your like personal belongings, I believe. Like our guitars weren't on it, but our backline rental was. So mm -hmm. essentially, if if that incorrectly flagged GMR status would have got us audited, um, we potentially then could have been fined thousands of dollars because our carne technically would have been inaccurate, mm -hmm. um, which is crazy because they they fine you six seven thousand dollars if you if your paperwork is inaccurate, it's fucking crazy that um, wild. because it, the, the assumption is that we'd be bringing those guitars into Europe to sell, which is so crazy, which is why I think this stuff needs an explicit distinction from freighting and trucking and being a band on tour. Mm -hmm. But anyways, the final layer of how fucked up this whole scenario was <laughs> and why it took, why it took 27 hours is that we got over the, we took the ferry, we got into Calais in France and the the Europeans don't give a fuck about the carne stuff. They don't require it. Like Brexit has doesn't apply to them in the same ways. So we literally spent like four hours at 10 p.m. driving around. 
the port of Calais trying to find where to get this carne stamped. And there was no signage, no nothing. At one point, a security car came over and like I, I walked up to I walked like 10 minutes over to a toll booth, like one of the border toll booths. And I was like, hey, we're clueless. I don't know where to go. You know, we've been through the border in and out twice trying to find this thing. We just need a stamp. Luckily, she spoke good English um, and uh, directed us kind of. Um, and then a security truck came over and was like, oh, I'll escort you. I'll be back in a half hour. Never showed back up. So we go through the border again um, and then eventually get directed to the wrong building. We get directed to a building that stamps Carnes but only on your way out. So they're like, oh, you got to go to the one on the way in. Follow this orange line, blah, blah, blah. Eventually, I stumble upon a building where a chick is smoking a cigarette outside on FaceTime with some dude. The building's pitch black. I'm like, hey, do you know where I get this document stamp? And she's like, oh, across the yard. I go to another pitch black building that lights up instantly. These four dudes are probably like smoking cigs and playing cards in like the back lounge. They reopen this office for me, stamp it in five seconds, and then we're on our way. Um, Dude, it's always like literally burning so much of my time, my energy. And then it's like the actual transaction of whatever we're doing takes like two literally seconds. a blink. Yeah. And, and I know that's all like probably just logistical, like whatnot to anyone listening. I, I'm sure it sounds <laughs> like a ultimately boring story, but it's like what, what should have been like a 12 hour travel day total, like borders accounted for turned into 27 hours. Yeah. It's crazy. That's yeah. that's fucking insane. Yeah. Like, it was not like that touring Europe before Brexit mm-hmm. and whatnot. It, it was the the worst encounter you'd have with uh, <laughs> the you go to the Swiss border and they want to count your merch and tax you. Like that's yeah. the, that was like the biggest. Oh god! Like we have mm-hmm. to go to Switzerland. That you know, say the merch is promotional and then they don't care and still tax you on it. You know, like yeah. it was never this complicated before yeah. that. But like, era. you know, again, like a lot of these things, whether it's like, um, you know, stuff that's happening out in Europe or like, you know, even stuff that's having, you know, back home on your own soil. Like those are the moments that kind of test your band's, you know, dynamic. And, you know, there's a lot of bands that have broken up or like, you know, might've had the potential to keep going, but like something, um happened and then they just weren't built for it and then they you know folded or maybe they changed some things to only do like local shit where you know the the ceiling might be a lot lower obviously but like you know the the stakes are not as high um but you know when you're you know when you're playing in a full-time band and you're doing all this there's no there's no clear like book that you can buy at fucking indigo or like do any of this shit to like really have the the clear guidance a lot of it is just learning on the fly and you know collectively choosing with all the people that you're gonna band with like yo this situation that, that we're in like fucking sucks but let's like push through and figure out a way so like you know if we can continue that this can never happen again hopefully yeah ex- exactly exactly and mm-hmm. you, the the carne stuff in particular has now been we've done europe twice and have learned more about this uh as we go and when we go back with stick to your guns in december it's going to be a bus tour so we don't have to worry about it as much like in the way of like there will be a head tm on that tour sorting all that stuff uh mm-hmm. The, you know we're we're way more removed from the process thankfully yeah. um, but you know the next time we headline out there like there's learned things from this mess of a experience that will be applied to the next time so right so um joey let's talk about the new record um you know a- as far as the time we're recording this uh y'all have dropped a, a few singles and uh you know koyo is not a band that even since you guys started have ever shied away from doing music videos or or any of that it feels like you guys have really embraced that and and utilized it for everything um that you've done promotionally um i want to talk about uh the most latest music video you're on the list minus one um that you guys put out and you know just i think today posted some behind the scenes in the in the midst of shooting Mm -hmm. that um which you know it was just like hilarious just the dynamic of like fully bringing in another you know obviously a homie band like regulate but like the dynamics of like 
the the song doesn't change like seb's doing like two parts but like he's making it so convincing you know like oh the, yeah with his mannerisms his, his uh, performance was excellent like yeah. he, he he came in prepared i i was really blown away he like mm -hmm. they 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 made the fucking video mm -hmm. um so do you do you want to just talk about like i guess like the idea in like the the production of that like was was it always an idea to do it in like a pasta shop or was that like you know or like a funny no kind of thing? so so originally the idea was to do it in an in uh our middle school um mm. that me harold and stanos all went to um because obviously it's like a it's about county the band, you know, yeah. like the, the goal was to do like a, a battle of the bands at the middle school that we uh, legitimately played a battle of the bands at when we were 12. Right. Um, we wanted to like rebuild the state, like, like do it verbatim. Um, and then it ended up being talks of doing it at our high school, which still would have been fine because we would have had this big auditorium. Um, and they bailed on us kind of last minute um, because they didn't want to break down sets from the school play um that was happening um so we were kind of in a rut and then our friend uh michael dubin who uh introduced us like we'd been before to this restaurant the pasta shop in jersey which is amazing it's mm -hmm. really really fucking incredible shit um and tommy who owns the place is a fucking a legend and uh an act like essentially like the judges in yeah uh, so he wasn't one of the judges. He's at the end of the video. He's the guy that slams the. Oh yeah, the, he puts out the, the sign, and then he like stops yes. the uh, the band battle of the mm -hmm. band, the literal battle of the bands. Precisely, <laughs> the precisely. Side. That that is uh that's Tommy, and he he's a fucking goat. He uh he literally like not to side tangent too much, but he he grew up in the town that the pasta shop is in. The pasta shop used to be a laundromat that he. Uh, would pass as he'd like take buses and stuff to the city. And as like a really, really young kid, he would go to shows at CBGBs and shit. And like, oh, apparently wow. like as like a, like an eight or nine year old, like H2O would bring him on stage and let him sing songs and shit. It was just like, he was just like a little ass kid who like got into hardcore via uh, like towny friends and stuff. And was just like around insane shit at a young age. It, it, it's pretty crazy. Hmm. Um, but anyways, um, Dubin uh, hit up Tommy and was like, yo, would they be able to do this here? And Tommy just hooked it up, let us do it there for free, fed us all catering style, like was so down with anything. Like I bought, I bought the breakaway glass bottles. We we're talking about breaking plates and shit. And he was just like, yeah, we'll clean it all up, whatever you got. And, and we obviously helped clean up, but him and, and this dude, Roy, that works there, like – we're just, you know, getting the getting everything back in order when the the shoot was done. Like it's like they they took such incredible uh, care of us. But mm -hmm. that's how that essentially happened was was by proxy of Dube. And it was like, yo, you got a free spot here if you want to do it. So we were like, battle the bands at an Italian restaurant. Fuck yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, so that kind of changed the 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 broader plot stayed the same. Um, and as we got with sam and connor who did the video they also did the mariches video um years ago uh we were just kind of like riffing on ideas and it kind of literally i think we were getting coffee in the city and i think that's where the literal idea of like oh like us and regulate should like fight spawned like like that's like there was this like idea that it would be like a back and forth thing like the seb taking the mic from me i think those those uh seeds were already planted mm. um i think the the plan was to do multiple bands originally and have like a bunch of local bands like lip syncing singing the song or whatever um but for for logistic and time's sake we were just like all right what if regulate comes in and just whoops us in every sense <laughs> performance <laughs> physically the, the the whole nine mm-hmm yeah, it was like it, it definitely would have made more sense if you were in a on an in an auditorium or like a school setting where there's more space where you know some people could be staged potatoes in the background while certain bands are playing. But when you're in that tight of a you know pasta shop, it's like it wouldn't make sense for you know three yeah. other bands to be you know watching and and doing all that. But I just I love the dynamic of that. And uh, yeah, I I have to shout out Seb because I was just like watching that at like eleven o'clock at night last night, just like 
because when he's singing your parts versus um uh your uh the other singer and guitar player in your band um, Harold yeah 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 when he's singing Harold's parts it it's like it's like something you would see on like a Disney show where it's like you know someone doing the same thing but they're like mannerisms and everything changes so um, it, it's yeah. it's perfect he, Seb <laughs> had a stint where he wanted to to act because he's a very talented actor and I think it ultimately is something he's not doing uh now like just you know doing other stuff in life but mm -hmm. he he's so talented in so many ways uh that that being one of them that when he came in and rocked that performance i was like this this worked like the actual idea of this video is that oh like we should get smoked by regulate um and you know feel type of way about it it's like when they were playing our song they just looked so much cooler than us <laughs> and performed it so much better i was like this video is real this is real life like, <laughs> this is a real thing <laughs> this is yeah. a real thing yeah what was but the it, um th there was some pastas on the table of the judges table and then you were eating some after what did you guys get to to snack on during the episode so so i don't remember what he prepared for the judges because he was making stuff on the fly for them just so he was like we were literally like should the judges have pasta like and, and tommy was <laughs> like yes like i can i can do this in like 10 minutes just give me right. a second i'll right set everybody up um but they did like a catering style like penne al vodka mozzarella sticks which their mozzarella sticks are fucking crazy like i know that mm -hmm. sounds like a rinky dink applebee's item but they do some <laughs> like artisan ass fucking mozzarella sticks um and I'm trying to remember what else. There was something else, Unli like unlimited cannolis that they do from scratch at the end, which were fucking awesome. Um, and there was one other uh, dish that was included in this crazy catering style spread that we ate outside. But that, like, it was awesome. Like, I I love going there to eat in general. You know, like I've <laughs> I've, I've I've only got a couple times because it's far from me. But anytime we're in Jersey and have the means, we try and pop in because it's the shit. Yeah, and what's the spot called again? So anyone who's listening can. can it it go. is it is the pasta shop, and I think if you look it up on Instagram, it, it like type in the pasta shop, it'll it'll come right up. I think okay. it's. I can't remember what town in Jersey it is. It's like a you only know the town if you live in Jersey type town, like you know like towny esque, mm -hmm. but it's it's like kind of in the cut in North Jersey, like a pretty quiet area. Okay, but it's, well it's, shout it's, out it's to the pasta awesome. shop that. You know, w when when I'm in the area next, that's the first spot I'm going to. So it, it's it's really worth it. And obviously, we all come from New York. We come from a not to develop any or you know stir up any Jersey, New York, uh, Italian discourse because I think there's room for plenty. <laughs> but but we come from a pretty in terms of Americanized Italian food. We come from the the spot, you know. So it's like for me to say that I'm not I'm not blowing smoke. It's really that fucking good. Like Tommy kills it it's mm -hmm. it's so good um so i want to take a little bit of a detour more down memory lane just real quick off of mm -hmm. off of the record onto some other stuff and i'm surprised really that we didn't cover this on your first episode but to me this is like a very iconic like early i think once this decade is over i think we'll be able to look back and i feel like this is a very iconic like 2020s like mosh related moment and it includes you so mm -hmm. you might remember when vatican played ldb fest many moons ago and there was the infamous everyone's holding up their nintendo switches and everyone's oh, yeah. like having this glorified gamer moment and then the the shot of you moshing with the switch in hand you know hits all the mm. ign's and all these different yeah, every, every major uh major game publication oh yeah, yeah. And I was just like, man, I can't believe, like, because I remember when that happened. And I think we, like, I, I only knew of, like, this is back when it was only typecast for you. You know, nothing else was in the mix. Yeah, yeah. Um, You know, obviously, that's, like, a pretty, um, it's a pretty old thing. But to take something old and make it new, what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you a video game system of our generations and then i want you to tell me if you were moshing with that system how you would be doing it mm -hmm. as well as what bands you would feel that would be appropriate for does that make sense interesting yeah I, I, it makes sense it makes sense okay so um you know we're gonna go back to 1996 
and talk about the one of the, in my opinion, goaded consoles of all time, the 64. So it's goaded. And, and, and it's undeniable. I'll, I'll give you I'll give you bonus points as well if you can name a band around that time frame. So it's like you get the 64 and then you're going on the weekend to uh, a show that's happening, you know, in that time frame. So obviously, you know, there's no pain of truths in the in 96. Right, right, 96. But something yeah. equivalent, you know. Hmm. Interesting. All right, go for it. So uh, or I, 64, I, I mean, I guess if if I'm in 96, it's like I could go see Hatebreed, which is pretty lit as an option um i I think across the board i mean if it's this era uh in terms of compactness you know the size of these things that they're a 64 is a burden um i i literally would have to presumably hold it with two hands Mm -hmm. there'd probably be some weird style going down for me um i guess i guess you could in theory put your fingers in where the the game cartridge would go and almost yeah as like it'd be some brute brute force uh type <laughs> behavior with that um but in an ideal setting i guess if it's 96 i'm going to see Hatebreed in connecticut right probably play a really scary show right. i'll probably get beat up for doing that yeah that, that's 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 my assumption. you would get gay keep so hard for doing that for sure yeah yeah i'm i'm, I'm, I'm getting whooped by by some real deal connecticut dudes that are yeah. like this is why this the fuck is... are you doing this <laughs> This is 2023, Joey, time traveling to all these eras, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so we jump into the time machine and we go forward a little bit to 2000, where the PS2 is, you know, the most talked about gaming console. Who in the 2000s? I don't got the slim yet, right? Um, Like, it's it's still still the thicky? I think, well, let me, I'll check The slim was probably like 2009. Yeah. Oh, well, 2004 is when it dropped. But 2004. All right. Yeah, let's let's say. All right. If 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 I'm in the 2000s, and it's particularly something I'm I'm trying to dance to, I'm probably probably again on Broken Wings, mm. once again with my PS2. This even I have even less options than an N64 because, like I said, <laughs> N64 I could probably pop my fingers in the yeah. slot. A PS2. Um, my assumption is I will initially grip it with two hands at some point that switches to one hand it will probably fly out of my hand get thrown at someone and again result in me getting whooped by a bunch (laughs) of massachusetts dudes um but that that is how i would foresee that unfolding (laughs) yeah there's a lot of broken wings peak period that'd be that'd be ideal that's a great answer honestly um okay so we go a few more years into the future um so so this console, you could probably, I'll give you the option to either be using the console itself or maybe some of the controllers or accessories that come with it. So we're into 2006, and we're talking about the Nintendo Wii with the infamous nunchucks. So oh, true. That's some stuff to practical. work with. It's, it, it's, it's a way practical. more practical effort. <laughs> so who in okay. 2006 are you uh, Nintendo Wii moshing for? That's a good question. I feel I feel like at that at that era we're on the cusp of like the late two thousands wave, like your whole backtrack incendiary king nine block. Mm-hmm. Um so perhaps I'll I'll just lean a little more in that direction. Uh eh, it's hard to say. I'm 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 really I'm thinking like too hard about the van part in, in the way of like <laughs> Like trying to get really articulate with the the period and 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 right. what would make what would make sense for the time. Mm-hmm. Um, Two thousand six. I mean, hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to think really, of a band that's really like thinking. It, it's 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 like such a particular time because it's like right in between like two full era uh For changing sure. of, of of the guards mm-hmm. you know if, if if i wanted to in 2006 i guess i guess i could go i, I could probably go to like a, a crime and stereo or have hard show on long island and probably very radically out of place be fucking around with the nunchucks mm-hmm. in the mosh pit and 
won't get whooped, but probably just get frowned at. I don't think anyone's <laughs> whooping me in that in that scenario. Yeah, not at a when half I, heart show, but you would have a lot of yeah. frowns for sure. Yeah, like mm-hmm. I I think it would just be uh people would just be disappointed in me <laughs> as they as, as they were, you know, like in, in the in the real scenario. Right. But uh, but uh, I I think I would just be frowned upon at that I, at that time. I think just leaning into this bit a little bit, I think your third, I guess, time traveling aspect of we're thinking of this as a timeline. I think this is where people are like, yo, that's the, the time traveling video game guy. Yeah. Or yeah. Like, at this point, it's a known I, thing. I've of spoken lore. about it for years, but like you only see him like maybe once it's real. a year. <laughs> it's real. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's really, really real. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. This this is, you know, we, you were mentioning how we're in a bit of a weird timeline on that last one, but I feel like this next one is kind of, this is the, the year prior to the Switch. So this is like the 2013, so the, the PS4 kind of thing. And that's like mm. a bit of a, a chunky machine for you to be, you know, being irresponsible with. So Yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely heavy. That's, that's burdensome. <laughs> um, at that time, at that time, Incendiary was like, I mean, I still are. I love that band. But they essentially were, you know, the one of the Long Island hardcore bands at the time that was just mm-hmm. literally maybe like hardcore. So probably them. Mm-hmm. Pro- probably, probably running around doing that. And uh, instead, at this point, it's 2013. So I'm probably being filmed and quietly talked about in proto group <laughs> chats. No right, one's whooping on me. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no one's gonna be, no one's gonna be harming me. But it's yeah. gonna make rounds via text <laughs> that, uh, that that was happening. It's like, why the fuck is this New Jack at the Incendiary Show? You know, doing this. And then there's so, some old head in the room. And they're like, oh yeah, I saw it back when it was, you know, in the in 90s, the 2000s. Saw it, saw it yeah, in April, yeah. I went to Connecticut. You know? Yeah, the first time I saw him, he had an N64 as like a as a glove that he was throwing around. So, mm-hmm. um, okay, so we hit the switch in 2017. Um, even though the the LDB moment happened in 2020, we're just you know, kind of making this 2018 actually, if I remember right, because I think that's the year we played LDB. Oh right, yeah. Okay, so the Switch. Well, okay, Nintendo. I think maybe 2019 actually. That might have been February 2019. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because my the Switch came right. out in 2017. Yeah, I remember I got my Switch on a tour. I bought it on Craig, like via Craigslist at uh, Twin Falls, Idaho. I met up with some dude in a Panda Express parking lot and gave him like 150 bucks cash. <laughs> It was pretty crazy. He's like, "Yeah, I'm moving out. To, I'm moving out east to the the you know like some random state in the Midwest." And mm. was like, "I don't need my Switch. I never use it." I was like, "All right, mm-hmm. my my come up then. Fuck it." Have you bought shit on tour like on Craig? That seems like a pretty tough thing just logistically because you're like, "I'm only here for this amount of time." But maybe you could strike a deal that way. I've, I don't know I've if you had more before. experience doing that. I, I mean, like, I don't think it's ever necessarily. Uh, I don't think it's benefited me in, as much in the deal sense as it just has from a uh, like getting people to respond way because it's like oh like I'm I'm down to do this today but I'm only here today so hit me up I I bought a couple games that way I bought my Switch that way like mm. if there was ever something that's like expensive ish and I have like enough money to afford it but if I can like catch a discount it's like I I, w- I would just turn to okay Denver Colorado Craigslist let's see if they got they got stuff on there, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that there's like, maybe maybe it's more about the, you know, if you're in a new city every day, you're in a new place that has, you know, different inventory levels of whatever you're on the hunt for, so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Okay, so just to kind of finish off, um, you know, we're into 2020 when the PS5, which is, you know, definitely the, the top, uh, game gaming machine right now so Mm. you know that's a bit of like a more you know aesthetically pleasing to look at machine so like or it's it it looks it's definitely like more bougie so i feel like i feel like the the band that you could be going after with something like this is probably i'm i feel like you could take it in in a multiple amount of ways because this is like the 
guy moshes with PS5, you know, we've already done the switch. So this is like even on bigger headlines. Yeah, we, we, we've all, and we're, we're in a whole new era of, uh, for better or worse, uh, very viral times, you know, so it's <laughs> like, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't dodge this if I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a good question. Hmm. I'm, I'm gonna throw a wild card pick for this one and uh and say well, there's a lot of uh, that's the other thing there's so many bands i can actually see in 2023 like like right. so many older bands are active it's like i i really have my pick of the lot here so like in it it's almost in a way of like i almost feel inclined to be like less articulate in my answer um <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm i'm gonna say I'm gonna say wreckage from Connecticut. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll throw some posy shit in there. Yeah. Ca- ca- counterbalance it a little yeah, bit with someone throwing around a five hundred dollar PS five. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm gonna throw a PS five during wreckage, and it'll get them some random shitty viral clicks. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 uh, that's that's, that's my, my way of giving back right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's that's awesome. Uh. Yeah. antithetical to everything scheme as a label is trying to do right which is part of part of why i picked that that's good yeah that's very funny um speaking of labels uh i noticed that you recently started your own uh with mm-hmm. 51st so uh tell me a little bit about that like um it, are you trying to keep it like as long island as possible or like you know is it kind of something to kind of do in your free time um it's it's so it's definitely um what's the word it, it's it's definitely like currently long island centered it's all long island bands thus far and i definitely always want to put a little extra priority to making sure if a long island band wants to come out on the label i make it happen mm-hmm. but it's it's open to any and all um and and uh really just comes down to like if i get sent something or catch wind of something that i think is dope and people are down to let me put it out. I'm I'm trying to. Um, I think I'm I think I'm figuring out doing a, a friends band from Massachusetts, um, and possibly doing CDs for the first time. Um, mostly it's just been taped so far, but you know it's 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 a a small, modest effort. Um, I'm not trying to rush it or force it. Just trying to help platform and put out bands. You know that need a, you know that or even just would appreciate that little extra you know, push when they get started and whatnot. Um, mm. It's mostly demos and little tape runs, like short print tape runs, nothing too crazy. Um, just kind of getting my feet wet with it and learning as I go in the way of like distribution and, you know, like a, a lot of, a lot of like the givens with label stuff is, is a uh, obvious stuff in the way of like, you know, you, press a record and it cost x and you need to make x to break even on it blah 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 but you know aside from all the obvious givens just kind of slowly learning as i go and asking friends here or there when i need help figuring it out but you know it's 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 a pretty open door right now in the way of like if a band is interested you know i'm i'm taking submissions i feel like i feel like a lot of the time with label stuff like I, I think other friends who've done labels have kind of said the same thing in the past when asked about it. It's like, it's, it's rarely the submission that gets a label interested in a band. Like there's lots of dope bands. There's lots of dope music. Typically it's a band kind of forcing their way into public attention by touring, playing, having a dope set at a show, a fest, whatever, whatever. Those are kind of the things that usually catch someone a little more. Um, and with that comes like a belief in it too. It's like, oh, like this band's kind of popping off on their own, doing their own thing. Like, okay, maybe I won't take a bath on putting their shit on a seven inch. You know, it's like that's uh that is part of the deal too. So, right. Don't get me wrong. Like, I I say all that in the way of like, I encourage people to hit me with their bands and their music, and you know, would love to do as much as I can. It's just a matter of like picking and choosing in the way of like the the capital and the money involved with the label because don't get me wrong none of it is all that crazy expensive i'm pressing tapes and cds like but it's all coming out of pocket it's all funded right. by my personal finance and so it's like definitely a little more picky choosy right now and we'll 
you know, hopefully as we keep going, because I'd like to do it indefinitely, you know, I want this to be a thing I do for years, um, you know, take on some more risk as, as we go, you know, try, try and just, you know, put on where I can, because end of the day, like I'm, I'm doing it because I just want to still be involved at, at, at ground level, especially as Koyo grows and keeps to keeps doing a lot of like, you know, bigger scale shit or whatever. It's like end of the day, I don't, I don't want to lose touch with what's going on at, at the floor, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I checked out, uh, I think it's last laugh is, uh, mm. a project is they put out uh, a demo. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic Dude, band. And I dope. love, I love it. That They're the, uh, they're the third band that I've put out on the label so far. The, they're really sick. Like they're, they're in my mind. It's like, if people liked the, 2008 to 2013 block it's it's like that type of hardcore you know it's it's very much the like influenced by new york hardcore like definitely has like groovier riffier type stuff but you know goes into into my shit it's like it's the classic tried and true hardcore combination of stuff you know Mm -hmm. but uh but i I i think they're great and they're getting right to it you know they have a weekend run literally this weekend like They've only played one show so far, and they're already going to be hitting Jersey and Philadelphia, I think Philadelphia, um, and then Long Island again this Sunday with, uh, right. with Risk and Opposition, I believe, from from Boston. So it's just cool. It's just cool to see them get into it right away, and that's that's the hope, you know. And yeah. and it and it for me, it's like I'm trying to support it as much as I can because my resources are obviously limited, being a small startup. But I'm trying my best to put on for for them put on for some merge put on for for life taken and just help build it up a little bit you know make people aware that the the bands are out there yeah yeah i, I remember when when you know uh lumpy's been on this show three times now and like you know the mm-hmm. last time we talked about it he, he you know said a lot of the things that you know we're we're talking about here where it's like you know for it's not like this expectation like i send something in and you ha- like why like someone not choosing to put it out doesn't mean it sucks. It just means maybe there's not enough bandwidth on their end. Maybe they just like, it's too risky, maybe based off some of the other stuff that's, you know, that they have going on right now, like with some other bands. And, you know, I I don't think it hurts to, you know, you know, put yourself out there in that way and, you know, send your music to stuff, especially if you believe in it. Um, Totally. But like at the end of the day, if like, It's not, I don't think it's even at the end of the day where it's like, if no one wants to put it out, you can put it out. Obviously you can still put it out, but like if your shit is good, there'll be someone who wants, who will put it out. It might not be like totally in the top three of your preferred, but it might be someone that helps connect you to someone else. And, you know, that was like a, a, you know, that was something, it seems pretty clear with Koyo where, you know, Triple B was kind of helping you guys out with the first couple of releases and then like the mm-hmm. pure noise thing kind of happened. And, you know, I know a lot of those, um, I, I know a lot of those guys are not like in the weeds about like, oh, well, I have to kind of keep you here. They're like, no, that's a great opportunity. Go, go and do that thing. Yeah, you know? for sure. For sure. And, and also like one thing I look back on very fondly, um, with Koyo particularly is that like the earliest releases were all in the hands of like small Parker labels, you know, like e- even, even before triple B there was a uh, reconsider records, which was a short lived long Island, uh little imprint uh, that, uh, or it's not an imprint. I don't know why I said that imprint implies it's of a bigger label, but uh, or entity, I guess was the word I was sure. looking for. Right. Um, but reconsider did like 11 or 12 releases and i think the if i'm correct the cd version of painting words into lines was the last one um albin uh chris albin went who now does scheme with kyle nyland uh reconsider was him and uh john scanlon from long island's collaborative effort um so scheme is like uh the the follow-up to reconsider in a sense um but, you know, Albin did that for us. Uh, Coming Strife did 10 inches of Painting Words into Lines through the UK. That's the first vinyl pressing we ever had. Um, Lumpy did the short beach sessions on like a tape for days. So it's like we got to like, and obviously did drives with 
with Sam and still repress drives with Sam's with the drives right. deluxe up. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's like we got to keep all of it in the house of friends and you know people we care about and whatnot. So it's like once we signed to Piernoy, it's like I didn't feel like we, you know, missed out on being able to to have that time for the band where it's like you know you're just putting out records with friends and mm -hmm. you know seeing where it goes and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so speaking about some other, you know, Long Island bands, uh, you know, just in like prepping for, for this, uh, this episode, it seemed that there's a band that Koyo might have some, like, I don't know, like beef with, I don't like really like getting into weeds with like some stuff I see between, cause there's not a lot of context, but the fact that one of those band is like saying like Koyo sucks a dick and they're trying to promote their own music i was like oh is there something more to this so uh the band's called uh Br blood runs black or or some shit like that so i don't i don't blood know runs if you cold runs cold oh okay Runs cold yeah, yeah, yeah. uh essentially uh long story yeah. short i beat the fuck out of the singer and he was being a real bitch about it just like you know made it like a whole thing that he got whooped like it was like a no contest thing i fucking beat the living shit out of him and instead of just keeping his mouth shut he went online and just you know made that stupid little fire and just started chirping away wow. um but you know i won in the end i i, I beat him so mm. have you seen him at a show and like confronted him at all uh, he just doesn't make eye contact with me at this point. I see him all the mm. time. Mm. Just doesn't even look up. But I don't know. I, I I haven't seen him since the flyer. So, due due to run into him again. <laughs> Would uh like are are they banned from any like Koyo show that uh that you guys might be playing or are you no, kind of like I'll just let it play out. Op open door policy. Come through open any door time. policy. Okay. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I see. I'm long out all the time, you know. <laughs> Is he in the room right now? He he very well might be in the room <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, 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 I hope I gave a good setup for that. Yeah, it, it was really good. I, I I fumbled the ball a little bit with you know mispronouncing the band name, but um... uh, it doesn't matter. It's a very similar band name. <laughs> uh, you know, all all jokes aside, like. I really like the the EP all dropped. Um, you know, I think when uh, you guys did the the first two songs um, as a sampler, I think we put that out on our because we have a, a listening party style podcast. Mm -hmm. um, so we put that out. But like, it's it's just so cool to see such a stark you know contrast from like Koyo to that, and like you know, it's not like you're playing bass in in this other band. You're you're still doing vocals in the other one, and it's like you know. If it feels like the the hardcore switch, like fully, you know, is it's not even a switch because I was thinking about this when I was watching some of the, you know, I think Koyo is an example where it's like hardcore is like a like not just a musical genre, but it is kind of just a mindset of like how we're carrying ourselves, how we're setting up for our live show. So it's like, for sure, it's just instead of singing you're screaming so it's more just on that front that switches versus yeah like... it, it, it's just a different side of the culture like it's all under the same roof if you would but but it's just a different uh different style amidst all of uh all of this but it, it's cool to be able to do both i i mean blood runs cold is essentially uh like many bands i i don't want to call it a COVID project but that's just the time that we're doing it we just had nothing to do mm -hmm. um evan and d uh, Little D, who played drums in Sanction and The Fight, um, and then Evan, who played guitar in Separated, which was kind of like the brother brand to, to Sanction from Long Island. Um, basically, uh, what's the word? Um, they, they wrote and recorded like the six songs like during COVID and um, hit me up once they had like rough mixes and were like, hey, do you want to sing on these? So we kind of spent the next year and change slowly but surely uh especially because the time the timing on this lined up where coil got started touring so like there was time there i was away um but i would pop in do like a song retract some stuff this and that and eventually we got it done sent it into lumpy took a while to press as 
vinyl does in this day mm. and age, but we finally, finally got it out. Uh, but it's awesome. It's just, it, it's, it's a local band. We don't play out too much. It's kind of a, the goal is kind of like, if you want to see it, you have to come to New York. Mm. Uh, you gotta, you gotta travel. You gotta come to the triple B showcase. Like we, we, we don't want to necessarily be even like a fly out band. Like we'll, we'll take things that are obvious to us. Like, like if, if it all lines up, like end of the day, we want to, we want to say yes to things. We're not trying to be snooty or picky or anything, but it's like, we, we want to, the mission statement was kind of like, let's give people a reason to drive from New Jersey to Long Island. You know, like mm. if you want to see this, you got to be here to see it. Um, but it's been really cool. It's a nice little palate cleanser. Like I obviously love doing Koyo and that's like my, you know, favorite shit and life's work and whatnot type band. But, uh, you know, I, I've, I've always had an affinity for, all styles of hardcore and you know in a perfect world i'd, I'd have nine bands that sound like nine different things you know it's just a, <laughs> this is just another uh another checked box just for, coincidentally a radically different one to to Koya. Yeah. no statement has uh, ever been true if i if i could have myself cloned or you know be uh the dude from the watchman and just be like in nine mm -hmm. different jam rooms at all given times um i would yeah. I, I would have i would have so many bands just to cover the entire spectrum of shit i like and then even the the minutia the niches the the mm -hmm. little pockets of uh of um you know bands that probably would just sound like other bands that i have but it's like well no these are influenced by these three bands instead <laughs> you know it's like co covering all those bases would be amazing right um yeah and sometimes like you know sometimes i get tangled up in the uh the adhd of like wanting to do something right then and there but like at the same time i'm like you know if if there's space and time for me to do this within the next couple of years that should that's just as better if not more attainable of a goal versus like oh i wish i could just start something right now and mm -hmm. you know hardcore is a beautiful thing that like you could theoretically i could sit down here record a demo send it to someone to to sing on it or scream on it upload it to Bandcamp, and publish it all within that same day now yeah. that's like the very like with no other things in the mix of it a very open schedule like a lot like like i, I don't know if you listen to any of the episodes with lumpy but like i talked to him about a lot of his like covid covid projects and bands where he had like mm -hmm. on shit from hold my own like screaming into his laptop and then he would put it on a song and then he would post it like yeah yeah this, he, like, he had so shit like many that. like boredom efforts like yeah one and done this will live on bank forever you know COVID <laughs> projects I, yeah. I remember him doing all that at the time mm -hmm. yeah but like you know that was one of the only times where we all had like the ample time to be able to do that. And that's turned into a lot of like side project bands that people had started. And now it's like their main project. Now that shows are back and things are thriving. Um, for sure. But, for sure. But with all that being said, it's like totally fine now to be like, I want to play this type. I want to write this kind of record, but like, maybe I'll do that. I want to make sure that I can do that in the next two years versus like, two weeks you know yeah Depending yeah exactly. on whatever you got Bro going on. broader more long-term uh li little i guess uh timelines on this stuff yes and, and and i i feel similarly like i i i almost like shouldn't even talk about it on here because it's not like a real thing but i've, yeah. I've been like because everyone's gonna talking. be like oh yeah what's yeah happening? yeah exactly <laughs> you're like it's, literally it's, nothing chill it's it's not like that yet but but i've been telling uh john who plays in vain and Flushwater, uh for like weeks now that i'm gonna send him riff ideas for like a hardcore band that we were talking about doing and, and we were talking about maybe having his brother sing in it like we we've been spitballing about it but but the the you know i'm i'm really bad at guitar i'm i don't i don't uh i can't play that well but john's really good so mm -hmm. it's like i feel like i can give him riff ideas and and you know, shoot it his way, but like, we were we were we were spitballing about it. I I don't want to get too caught up in it because it's not a real thing at all. But it's like, <laughs> if that does happen, here's the first public acknowledgement that that was even an idea. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll well, I'll probably play guitar badly in this band if given the option. 
Yeah. Well, sometimes it's like, it's kind of fun just to either like document it either on the podcast or like, I think I post on Twitter. I'm like, I'm manifesting that I'm playing bass in a band in the next couple of years or, or something to that effect. Like just to be like, okay, this is something I want to do. I'm going to put it out there and maybe there's something else that happens that kind of has a, a, like helps maybe even speed it up if anything. Cause someone else is yeah, like, Hey, yeah. I also want to do that or whatever. So Mm -hmm. um joey one of the last things i want to talk to you about because we we hit on this very seldom um on our first interview but i found out that you're a big reality tv show um head and yes. was getting into a lot of that and i feel like potentially because i was like in the midst of all that but i feel since we since we've last talked i have like been on such a not a marathon. It's just been like all consuming with mm -hmm. what types of shows. So I wanted to first check in and see if there's anything specific that you've been watching in the last year or so or any series that have been like, holy fuck, how do people like not know about X, Y, or Z when it comes to reality TV? So, so no, no deep cuts. Um, I've, I've, Ironically enough, I feel like we've kind of had an inverted experience where, like, I've just been so busy. I haven't been as caught up as I once was. Um, mm -hmm. I was watching the new season of Love is Blind. I'd never checked that show out. And that shit's pretty crazy because mm -hmm. they just want people to get married right away <laughs> after just talking through a wall. Yeah, so that, that's that's a pretty insane concept. Um, I watched uh, I watched Love on the Spectrum when that was popping off. Like everyone was talking about that one for a while. That one was like viral. And that, mm -hmm. that that shit was pretty wholesome, you know. That was a, a good watch, um, but those were the the two I can think of off the dome that I recently actually like clocked in for. I've I've been so bad with TV in general or just keeping up with anything, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like I I recently uh this is obviously a tangent tip, but but uh you know I've been playing that Baldur's Gate three game that uh obviously has went pretty above ground is like a, a a big smash hit of a game and i think i've clocked like 30 hours on it and by my standards by my current life standards that's like a shit ton of time like i haven't <laughs> i haven't put, put that much like the fact that i will probably beat the main story of this game that hasn't happened in years i just have mm. not had time to like be as uh no life about, about anything <laughs> with the remote in hand yeah 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 exactly exactly mm -hmm. like which is you know so much of my life that was instinct and the last couple of years i really haven't had the means to or even just the willingness to to be like that um <laughs> as much as i love it i just, I just haven't uh have been available to mm -hmm. grind out like that but to to cycle back to your initial question those were the the two that caught me recently that i enjoyed um but what have you been watching now that you're you're in the game? Yeah, so right now um, we're just finishing up the, I guess it's the fifth season of Love Island. Um, ah, so singer typecast, huge, huge Love Island head. Okay, huge, huge, yeah. huge. So that's it's been, been a juicy ass years. season. Um, without giving too much away, in case you want to like indulge in in any of it, <laughs> post this podcast, but. Um, this year they had this dude on name his name is Bergy and like I don't even need to describe how he looks physically but I'll just describe like where he's from and what he does so he's from South Dakota and he's a GM for Dairy Queen interesting so, very so interesting is, life <laughs> yeah yeah so without even having to explain how he looks physically he he's the oddity of like the the leo who's like a personal trainer and he's like cut and right tan he, he's, and like, he's the standout amidst yeah. the presumable love island types you know right and he's also you know this is off of the i think they start with like five can or sorry 10 contestants five gals and five guys and mm. um he's the last guy who comes out and it was definitely like the didn't end on a high note kind of thing because no yeah, one yeah yeah wanted to move for him and every single girl on the on the season who would get paired up with him either just out of not having to be kicked off the show um 
you know, they're mm-hmm. trying, but they're like, yeah, I'm not like, I'm not about not it. feeling this. So he's supposed to. And, and they're definitely saying shit like, I'm just not feeling a spark with him. You know, like they're, yeah, they're, they're, it literally they're... shit like that. It's mm-hmm. like, it's like, I don't know. Like he's a, it's the classic, like he's a really good guy, but like, I just, you know, I can't see it going long term here. And he yeah. is like one of the most innocent humans I've ever seen on like, a reality TV show and in, in like the 2022, 2023 kind of time frame. Um, he gets so him and his partner are at the bottom of the the voting list for like the the first like um blocking or whatever it's called. And mm-hmm. the the host says, um the between the two of you, between him and his partner, you two have to choose who goes and who stays. And like being the good guy that he is, he's like, well, I, I, like there's clearly no one here for me. I, I'll go. And then she's like crying, yeah. and everyone else is like, oh man. Everyone's like, oh what man. But everyone's <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, 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 it makes sense that you're leaving, bro. So then they're like mm-hmm. doing the out of the villa interview, you know, where it's like, you know, I I love my time here, blah blah blah. And then he gets like, they all get uh, notified on the. You know, when challenges or certain things happen in the show, like via text. So he gets a text and it says, your time here is not up. And then he's going into like a secret room with two new girls who are coming into the show. And then so like the next day, these two new girls come out and then he's like, I'm back. And he has survived shit. this whole season with with the whole time with having other girls that are like trying to maybe do something and then not but then America would vote him the highest so i was like i've just been riding for this dude just because he's like a dakota boy who like has no business being on this super hot like reality yeah, tv yeah. show thing but i will say you know i think i have like 3 episodes left but he actually got paired up with some girl who like she's a looker and she, uh, mm. like, she's like, I'm physically attracted to this man. And I was like, is this a bit? Or, But I'm I'm starting to believe it. Are, are you just the one that's like, well, someone's got to be down, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. Damn, that sounds awesome. Yeah. I, I, I got to hit Dylan up about this shit. Sounds yeah. great. Yeah. And if I could plug one more for you, um, it's so funny. I've been like, this has been in the back of my brain every show I've watched. I'm like, I wonder if Joey's watching this show as well. <laughs> dude, I've, I've been tapped out, but this makes yeah. me want to tap back in. Yeah, dude, you're like, oh, sign me up. Okay, so so that show's on on Crave. If you go on to Prime, um, the first three seasons of a show called Below Deck are like some of the best drama TV I've ever seen. That I've never even heard of. Like okay. I, I don't know what the so this deal is. This is more island. deep cut because like Love Island, like they have a UK series, they have a fucking Canadian version. When I heard about right. Below Deck, I was they. Th- I think there's two versions of Below Deck, but like it's a little bit more niche. So it's a crew of people on like a multi million dollar like super yacht, and essentially a season is like a charter season. So there's like maybe eight charters that they'll go on. And then there's the interior deck team and then the, uh, the exterior. So like the people that clean and, you know, do the anchor poles and all that shit. And then the people that Mm -hmm. like wait on and like, it's the drama between them all internally. Cause they're all like, fucking and you know having their different power dynamics yeah yeah that's happening below deck while everyone else is being served you know cold food or or something's going awry but like even some of like the guests who are coming on like to hire these people are some of the most like out of pocket wacky motherfuckers i've ever heard of so Uh, i'm sure it's, it's like a like total misfit cast of people dude like i think in season two there's like like they're all like up on the top um hot tub like almost having like no not even almost having they're having a full on like orgy and then they're yeah. <laughs> they're like asking the people to join them and they're like oh no i'll just get your drinks and just yeah, like <laughs> yeah i'll just get you you know here's your vodka soda here's your espresso your ta- <laughs> espresso yeah yeah but um the first 3 seasons of that show i was like holy crap this shit is so 
like that that sounds deranged dude that shit sounds Very fucking deranged. crazy so those would be my two suggestions love island and uh below deck below and, deck and for the for the listeners you know if you have a a favorite you know reality tv show i'm sure there's i'm sure people are like all right i think this episode with joey's over now that they're talking about this shit so i'll let you know <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that, that, that's that's like the the sure sign <laughs> the mm-hmm. end. yeah but you know it's a uh, Maybe I'm pulling you back into like I will say it is fun, but at the same time it's like, you know, you get into the because I remember when Colin because Colin worked on some TV shows, um, yeah, uh, in his time and he, there's a, I watch it with an era of like, is this the producer doing this? Oh, that that conversation felt like way too forced or cut together. Yeah, like, how, how much this was set up um, because because almost all of it is uh, uh essentially almost all like reality television is obviously fabricated to a certain degree and uh set up by producers and scenarios are set up by by showrunners and whatnot hmm. um but but there is always that question of like where where in like the fiction to reality spectrum do, does exactly an individual conversation lie you know mm-hmm. yeah but, so okay so maybe the final question i can ask you on this bit if you were kind of like okay i need to get back into because i believe i've learned that watching these shows with you know me and my partner we would watch that a lot but like for this newest um love island show i've been watching it with uh my sister who moved back home as well so that's been fun because we're always like just talking about the different dynamics while it's happening. So my yeah. question, if you were like, okay, I got to boot up one of these shows that Spencer has talked about and you could watch it with, let's say three other people, not even just like within your neck of the woods, but just like hardcore in general that, you know, like would get giddy about some of that shit. Like who are like the three people that you would want to do like a viewing part? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I, I think, I think I'm gonna say, and, and, and not for the sake of a, to, not to cheapen the answer because, it, because it ultimately is an easy answer, mm. but I, I, I would ultimately just say like Anthony, Jeremy and John from Bain, because not only are they obviously some of my very close friends, but, but, uh, we watched all of that Jocelyn's cabaret show that I think mm-hmm. I mentioned the last time I was on did. together on the couch at their apartment in Lowell. Like we were watching that unfold weekly in season two and it was just, it was like an event. So I think, I think by default I would need to get whatever I would get tapped back into in a, in a perfect <laughs> world. I'd do it with the, the three of them, you know, that's well, like, like below deck with the three of them watching it unfold weekly is, is an ideal scenario for me. Yeah, I I uh, I went to. I was like, I feel bad that I didn't go and check out that that cabaret show that uh, that Joey mentioned, and I watched the like the t. Te- I think it was a. Uh, it was the episode one for season two, which is the Atlanta season. But they did like a recap from like the the season prior, and I was mm-hmm. like, holy fuck! I have been sleeping. Dude, so that is it's, it's that insane. is happening right after I'm done Love Island. Like I don't care it, if I have to watch that by myself. That looks. You, you might want to take like a week break to like <laughs> <laughs> mentally recoup before you watch that shit because it's it's like it's it's laborious almost because it's just so fucking cracked. Mm. It's crazy. Yeah, like the like I think in some of the the recap like moments like they're bleeping. Like they're, they're bleep. They've they have more bleeps in the dialogue than they do actual yeah. words. <laughs> no, hundred percent. They they are like <laughs> popping off at light speed, just saying the most insane shit. And the the again, as I mentioned, presumably on the last episode, uh, the crazy thing about that show is it ends in violence every time. It <laughs> ends in a huge brawl every time. Like they they don't get separated by producers like. These girls just whoop the shit out of each other. It's insane. It's Dude. fucking crazy. So good. Um. So, uh, Joey, we have to end as we always do with a mosh-related story to kind of end the episode. I know the. I don't know if you recall the one you told last time. I I, I believe I do. Yeah. Yeah. 
So we can leave that. Uh, yeah. So, and I and I hope you have something of of equal magnitude. Uh, but you know, I always try to go whatever's the first thing to your head versus you trying to overthink it. My story first thing to my head. Um, it's a good question. This is our like you know when you're at like a a dinner and then they're like you guys want some dessert and then it's like you get the yeah it's yeah, not it's, even it's it, not even do you want dessert you get the complimentary this is the, this is the birthday and dessert. ice cream yeah the birthday dessert yes mm. that 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 is a uh, that's that's a good question I'm I'm trying to think of something I actually can talk about. <laughs> That so, something that I'm like, having deja vu from the last. It's disparaging. <laughs> uh, it's, it's so hard because so much. Uh, so okay, this this is not as good of an answer, but you said first thing that comes to your mind, so I'll let yep. this roll. So this is different this, from the last time, right? Yes, it, okay, this doesn't okay. directly pertain to me, but it does in a way as well. Um, okay, so. So this band Life Taken that I am that I put out on my label, um, it is uh, so it, it's uh, the singer Jimmy Longspaw is a Long Island enigma. He's a a known character, um, and and I love him dearly. Jimmy's great. Uh, the band just got going, and they ha- the band mostly sounds like a beatdown band. I'd say you listen to the the tracks, and it, it's predominantly. Uh, heavier hardcore and then they have this song called party all night that is a little a little more punky if, if you want to compare and contrast and there's a, a chant line called skate party drink where they just chant over and over again skate party drink skate party drink and uh it, the long island is taken to it people really love that line mm. so uh i got i got somehow uh orchestrated them shooting a music video in a backyard for it um and all the clips look ridiculous people hitting each other with wiffle ball bats and flipping (laughs) tables and just being insane Uh, i'm getting all the raw footage for it tomorrow and i am gonna be uh editing the music video so it's my vision let's go it's 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 my vision on that uh so (laughs) so let it be known when that drops that that is that is my vision for for how this uh, silly music video should be, and it's all just footage of people uh, moshing and presumably skating, partying and drinking. So party all night, life taken. That is the mosh story. You'll see that shit <laughs> whenever I'm done editing it. It's not even a mosh story. It's a mosh movie coming soon. Yeah, to exactly. DVD. I'm I'm making a mosh movie. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I if I wasn't in California right now, I would have filmed it and directed it too like <laughs> the only thing it's missing is is me being at this backyard to right. ask people to do stupid shit for for my own sick twisted you know <laughs> uh d- desire yeah well you know it's on you to try to make that um as sick if not sicker than the taking back sunday playing in long island uh video that dropped yesterday as well yeah th- so. th- that that that's essentially this is going to be like the bizarro version of that from hell. Yeah, like <laughs> this, this is like the taking the back Sunday is super, Superman. Life taken is bizarro. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Perfect Two things that comparison. at one point in time presumably never would have been in the same sentence, but <laughs> that's that's 2023 for you. It's it's uh everything is bizarrely uh tangential. Very very true. Um. Koyo's new record, Would You Miss It, is coming out in September the 29th is the official yes. drop date. 29th, um, you got it. All the links to where you can purchase it, where you can pre-order it, where you can follow the band will be in the description and in the show notes. Joey, anything you want to send the people off with, shout out or plug, the floor is yours, my friend. Um, Obviously, appreciate you having me back and psyched we could we could do this again. Um, I don't have anything too specific that we didn't go over already in terms of plug-in. You know, it's just obviously with the core record coming out, like just encourage people to listen and pre-order a record if you haven't, because that stuff means a shit ton to bands more than I think 
people realize. Um, and of course, come see us when we play because those those are like the number one things you can do to support that. And you know, check out Blood Runs Cold, check out Typecast if you've never listened, and Fifty First State Records as as an entity. Like we primarily operate off Instagram at this point, which is funny because that's just the modern way things are. So if you can just shoot that a follow and maybe consider picking up a tape, that means a lot to me personally because that's. That's all me. That's that's the solo endeavor. So mm-hmm. every that's going right to my support. inbox. Yeah. Yeah. Every 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 single bit of support, I I see it all in any capacity—a share, a like, a a follow, whatever, whatever. It's I'm I'm the I'm the whole business. So you know, it's it's, <laughs> it's uh it, it means a little extra. But all in yeah. all, just thanks if you support the random crap that I do with my life. Of course, yeah, and I'm happy to because you know not only are you so enjoy that you know I feel like wears your heart on your sleeve a lot. I feel like you're very self-aware. I think that we've covered a lot of points, like specifically in this um, interview, that you seem to be someone, to me at least, that's like very eager to learn, even through all the hardships and trials that may come with that. Um, for sure. But yeah, I wish nothing but the best for the new record. I'm going to see you um, get to play some of those songs uh, in the next couple Hell months. Yeah. And Dude, thanks again for the great chat. Dude, appreciate you having me. Seriously, so much.